Can we save our planet? Will we continue to have access to water, food, energy, and other ecosystem goods that our planet provides? Each hour, three species disappear. Each day, 10,000 people die from water shortage or contamination. 14 billion pounds of garbage are dumped into the ocean every year. Most of it's plastic, and it'll take nearly 1,000 years for it to degrade. And due to global warming, the Arctic may be ice-free, and thousands of cities, including New York City, may be underwater. Now, you've all undoubtedly heard many of these statistics before, and likely, at least so far, you aren't impressed. <laughs> and yet still, in some sense, these facts turn societal platitudes motivate us. They certainly motivate me, and I, perhaps like many of you, am the typical environmentalist. I gleefully present my refillable cup to the Starbucks barista. I love to shop at Trader Joe's, and I always bring my Go Green bag. And if you're anything like me, I spend one to two minutes in a fit of confusion trying to recycle the fork, bowl, napkin, and food that constitutes my salad. And while my New Yorker instinct is to avoid eye contact with an over-eager, sidewalk-soliciting environmentalist, I proudly flash them a smile, simply to remind them that I support what they do. And as I reflect on my eco-friendly day, I sleep like a baby, <laughs> knowing I made a difference. And I know what you're thinking. You could do so much more. And you'd be right. I could do a lot more. I could compost, and I don't. I could walk to work through Central Park, and I don't. And as one environmental campaign suggested, I could get clean and save water by sharing with a friend or even an attractive stranger. <laughs> don't get too excited for me. I shower alone, often for many minutes at a time. <laughs> Undoubtedly, we all could do more. But what if I told you that I did make a more difficult sacrifice for our planet? What if I told you that I am a vegan? <laughs> did you feel that? <laughs> you did. One word, and everyone gets a little bit nervous. You can be honest with me. This is TEDx. It's a safe space you feel a little awkward. Why? Because I am a vegan, and presumably many of you are not? What is that about? Well, we've all had that conversation before. You're out to dinner with a friend or a colleague, and you learn that the person you're with is a vegan. You had no idea. You're surprised. And while the person in front of you may not look like this, <laughs> Or like this, your perception of them has immediately changed. There is no going back to whatever it was you thought of them before this moment. Now, back at dinner, the vegan likely feels compelled to explain to you that while he or she is a vegan, by no means did your culinary decision inspire offense. You, in turn, decide to kindly acknowledge that reconciling gesture and attempt to very quickly move the conversation along to a more unifying topic. And yet, you still feel whatever it is you or your neighbor might be feeling right now. A tinge of nervousness, a pulse of discomfort, the manifestation of a mouth twinge or the eyes widening. There is me, and then there's you. And somehow, our perception of one another is no longer the same. Well, as it turns out, I'm not a vegan. <laughs> I'm sorry to all the vegans in the room who have lost one of their own. <laughs> and to the rest of you, while well, you can safely take a deep sigh of relief knowing that I am a carnivore just like you. But whatever connotations are in the word vegan, and the experiences those connotations create in our mind, I am absolutely fascinated by them and think they may hold, at least in part, 
a key to solving complex problems like global warming and the loss of biodiversity. Now, semantics aside for just a moment, we all know that vegans and vegetarians, the modern day pioneers of abstaining from meat, are onto something, even if we ourselves choose to eat eggs and meat. We know our planet is in trouble, and we know that meat production, from the clearing of land and trees to the transportation of these products, accounts for nearly 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. 20%. That is why a vegetarian's footprint is nearly half that of a meat lover's. And for a vegan, it's even lower. And we also know that meat production requires a lot of water. Producing just one pound of meat protein requires 10 times the amount of water as producing one pound of grain protein. It's a lot of water. And we also know, perhaps most morally salient, that due to factory farming, that animals are not treated very well. They're not. And they are incredibly smart and experience pain just like us. So as we look into the eyes of this very adorable baby pig, we have to ask ourselves, why do over 90% of Americans continue to eat meat? Bacon. <laughs> bacon is the reason we eat meat. For many, the mere smell of bacon in the morning, that crispy, crunchy texture, that savory, salty taste, they give us a reason to smile. That spicy buffalo wing, that juicy steak, they are the reason we eat meat. They satisfy our most primal urges. So what should we do? Well, on the one hand, we know that meat gives us reason to smile in the morning. And on the other, we know it straddles our instinct to uphold our sense of morality with its questionable impact on the planet. Plus, as some of the medical literature suggests, meat may not be very healthy for us. Well, certainly we could treat each meal as a choice, either to indulge or to make a more restrained decision. We could simply eat less meat and more fruits and vegetables. That seems simple enough. And as many have suggested, if we simply followed a meatless Monday diet, whereby we abstain from eating meat on Mondays, we'd have a billion vegetarians overnight. And that would be huge. But what is a person who eats less meat? They may not be a vegetarian or a vegan, or even on any particular diet. Where do they fall along the spectrum? Well, I've discovered that there are a few words, each with their own connotations, to describe a person who eats less meat. You could say, I'm a semi-vegetarian. I sometimes eat meat, and sometimes I don't. You could say, I'm a mostly vegetarian. I mostly eat fruits and vegetables. I sometimes eat meat, but I try not to eat a lot of it. Or you could say, and this one's by far my favorite, that I'm a flexitarian. I'm flexible about it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I eat meat, and sometimes I don't. So imagine we're back at dinner, and the person you're with has just explained to you that he or she is a vegan. And you decide to enthusiastically share that you get it. I'm a flexitarian. I'm flexible about it. I sometimes eat meat, and sometimes I don't. But I try not to eat a lot of it. And as you continue to eat your steak, and he or she continues to eat her vegetable quinoa bowl, you realize, perhaps unconsciously, that you still fall somewhere different along this moral landscape. Well, we know with simple intuition that flexitarian sounds, well, flexible. That by choosing to eat meat sometimes, as opposed to never eating meat, you alter your moral standards for primal urges and convenience. It's weak, and it's inconsistent. And as we know from advances in cognitive science, the brain does not do well with inconsistencies. It loves false dichotomies and neat compartmentalizations. And we can see how this plays out. One minute, you're a noble lover of all forms of life. And the next, you're a ravenous animal, or at least ravenously eating one. So whatever it is about words like flexitarian and vegan, we know they conjure entirely different perceptions of who we are, and that these perceptions matter 
These seemingly innocuous labels to describe our eating choices matter a great deal. They determine how seriously we are taken, how our messages are understood, and our feeling of belonging. Consider a related example, climate change versus global warming. Scientifically, they have different meanings. One refers to climate, while the other temperature alone. But regardless of what they actually mean, they conjure different mental associations. A 2014 study from Yale University found that the term global warming was associated with greater public understanding, more emotional engagement, and support for personal and collective action than the term climate change. Global warming generates more intense worries and negative reactions than climate change. That is why I try to use the phrase global warming more than climate change. So we see the same type of problem with words like flexitarian and semi-vegetarian. They all describe incredibly positive steps toward a more sustainable planet, but they largely invoke negative associations, feelings of division, and moral incompatibility. So it occurred to me, we need a word that describes a community of individuals who are committed to reducing their consumption of meat and can encourage others to reduce their consumption of cows, chickens, pigs, lambs, and seafood. It is my hope that this word is reducitarian and that it can inspire a community of individuals to simply eat less meat. And I bet many of you here today are already reducitarians. How many of you try to eat less meat? You are all reducitarians already. And to my vegan and vegetarian friends, you too are reducitarians because you are so very much committed to reducing your consumption of meat. Reducitarianism is the practice of reducing one's personal consumption of meat, red meat, seafood, and poultry. Now, reducitarians may still enjoy the taste of meat or are not concerned with making a drastic lifestyle change, but they are committed to reducing their consumption of meat nonetheless. With more fruits and veggies, reducitarians live longer, healthier, and happier lives. They set manageable and therefore actionable goals to gradually reduce their meat consumption. For example, they may order a smaller steak or skip eating meat for dinner if they had it for lunch or simply eat meat only on the weekends. And reducitarians know that by choosing to eat less meat, they're not only going to improve themselves and the environment, but farm animals as well. Now, the concept of reducitarianism is appealing because not everyone is able or willing to follow a completely vegetarian diet. This is a difficult but important realization. Not everyone is able or willing to follow a completely vegetarian diet. A Gallup poll conducted in 2012 asked a diverse group of Americans the following question. In terms of your eating preference, do you consider yourself to be a vegetarian or not? How would you respond? What do you think they found? Well, what they found was that on average, only 5% of Americans consider themselves to be a vegetarian. But what was so interesting about this 5% is that it remained largely unchanged from the 6% that was recorded in 1999 and 2001. In other words, the amount of vegetarians in the United States has remained about the same, extremely low. And as you might imagine, this percentage is even lower for vegans. Similar statistics have been observed throughout the world. And just in case you aren't convinced, a separate study found that among those who consider themselves to be a vegetarian, nearly two-thirds of them had indicated that they recently eaten meat when they were asked to recall their diet. <laughs> These individuals were not vegetarians or vegans. They were reducitarians, but they were forced to play mental gymnastics with themselves without a word to describe who they are. And this used to happen to me all the time. My friends and family knew that I was a vegetarian, and once in a while, we would go out to eat, I'd order bacon with my eggs and pancakes, and they would literally catch me in the act, red-handed, <laughs> eating a slice of bacon. Do you know what it's like for a Jewish vegetarian to be caught <laughs> eating bacon? 
That is a double whammy no one wants to experience with their morning coffee. So look, what I think this means is that even though we know it would be better, more healthy and environmentally friendly, if everyone just stopped eating meat, this is an ideal, a romantic ideal, that we have been unable to achieve. This message of completely eliminating meat consumption has worked very well, or somewhat well, for the individuals who are vegetarians or vegans, but has failed to capture the attention of the rest of us, the 95% of us who continue to inhabit this planet. So yes, reducitarianism is a message for the 95% of us. We should consider eating less meat for the sake of our health and the environment. And we can learn a lot from vegans and vegetarians who have so admirably reduced their meat consumption that they effectively eat none at all. But vegans and vegetarians can also learn a great deal from those who simply strive to eat less meat. In many ways, the use of categorical imperatives that we must never eat meat has put vegans and vegetarians and those who simply strive to eat less meat in a boxing match for moral superiority. It's exhausting, and as the data suggests, largely unproductive. Reducitarianism is a message that allows us to focus not on our differences, but on our shared commitment to eating less meat, regardless of where we fall along the spectrum. I believe that this reducitarian message will absolutely terrify the meat industry because it is a message that will produce the greatest impact on the causes we all care so deeply about. After all, what could possibly matter more than the increased well-being of our health and the environment? It is my hope that we can leverage reducitarian, a positive and inclusive term of moral worth to encourage ourselves and others to eat less meat, improving the health, improving our health and the environment and making a lot of animals very happy in the process. It starts with us, all of us, to encourage ourselves and others to simply eat less meat. So this is my message to you. Consider eating less meat this week and be a reducitarian. You can change the world by ordering a smaller steak or doing something more, but don't just sit by and ignore what you already know. Consider eating less meat and be a reducitarian. Save our planet, improve your health, and save a lot of animals. Thank you so much.